General Flynn, you are now recognized for your testimony. General Flynn. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, distinguished members of this committee, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and speak about the Army's actions in response to the event in our nation's capital on January 6th. I served as the Deputy Chief of Staff at G357, the equivalent of the Chief Operating Officer for the Army's 1.2 million soldiers. I was in charge of operations, plans, training, and strategy. As an American citizen, I was shocked and I was angered at the events of January 6th. As a soldier devoted to upholding our Constitution, I performed my duties and responded to the unfortunate events that occurred that day. To that end, I will address two areas today, my organization's activities and my individual actions. In the days prior to January 6th, the DC authorities submitted a request for federal forces to support an unarmed non-law enforcement mission by the DC National Guard. That request focused on support to draft traffic control points and crowd management near metro stations. The Army received no other requests for assistance. The DC National Guard then determined this re request would require roughly 350 unarmed soldiers to cover two separate shifts. This included a 40 person quick reaction force at Joint Base Andrews and that quick reaction force was intended to augment crowd control and establish traffic control points if required. The DC National Guard equipped those soldiers and airmen with body armors and helmets, which were stored in nearby government vehicles. Riot control gear, such as shields, leg protection, and full face shields remain stored at the DC Guard Armory. Because the National Guard forces, including the Quick Reaction Force, were never requested to serve as a riot control force, my Director of Current Operations, a Brigadier General, validated these requirements and with Secretary McCarthy's endorsement, Acting SecDef Miller approved the request and assigned the mission on Monday, January the 4th. I'll now transition and describe my actions on January the 6th. Early that afternoon, I was holding a meeting in my office. At approximately 2.21, I was alerted that the Capitol was under attack and that Secretary McCarthy's office had requested me to move to his office. Not, ne not yet knowing the scope of the problem, I moved quickly to Secretary McCarthy's office. I saw him walking out while giving instructions to numerous staff members that were already in the room. He was already on his way to meet with acting SecDef Miller. My director of current operations, a Brigadier General was with him. Continuing further into his office, I saw the director of the Army staff, Lieutenant General Pyatt in the rear of the room. He was standing over a speakerphone and he was the only person in the office speaking on the call. Reaching his side, I recall hearing an unidentified person on the other end of the speakerphone tensely ask, are you denying our request? General Pyatt responded with words to the effect, I am not denying your request. I am waiting for an answer from Secretary McCarthy, who is with the acting Secretary of Defense presently. In the meantime, we should develop a plan. Seconds later, I recall a second question from a second unidentified person who asked, and to be clear, are you denying our request for National Guard forces to be used? General Pyatt's response was similar to his first statement. I immediately realized the gravity of the situation and it was very, very serious. Both speakers on the phone sounded highly agitated and even panicked. I recognized General Pyatt's calm demeanor 
It was a combat experienced leader reacting to an otherwise violent and unpredictable event. I then realized, as General Pyatt has said, the situation required the Army staff to rapidly develop and execute a plan. As the Chief Operating Officer, I needed to initiate those efforts with absolute urgency, and I did. Having been in the room for roughly four minutes, I quickly moved to my office and began coordinating with numerous Army staff leaders across our large staff and across other Army commands so that we could rapidly facilitate and execute any decisions made by Secretary McCarthy and Acting Secretary of Defense Miller. This team of over 40 officers and non-commissioned officers immediately worked to recall the 154 DC National Guard personnel from their current missions, reorganize them, re-equip them, and begin to redeploy them to the Capitol. We also began to coordinate for the arrival of neighboring states that were committing National Guard forces into the District of Columbia. Simultaneously, we had to gather materials, do surveys, and plan for barrier materials to be moved to the Capitol in order to protect that institution and you, and many, many other tasks. This work continued with utter focus and urgency throughout the night of January 6th and well afterwards. The DC National Guard's airmen and soldiers response that day on, the Janu on January 6th is an absolute testament to their dedication to duty and their unquestionable defense of the Constitution of the United States. However, the events of January 6th must never be able to occur again. We must address the circumstances that allowed it to happen. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Thank you for asking me to appear before you. And thank you for seeking my perspectives on the Army's actions that day. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Flynn. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah, you know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. 
But then they focus on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th th there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket Constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my Constitution. In the FBI's view... The top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.